Good day, everyone. I'd like to share with you a few of the findings that I think um, I've been able to discover about improving city competitiveness as a result of my engagement with the World Bank Institute over the last couple of years. This is our motivating question. Uh, it is what do city leaders want for their residents? And I believe we can all agree that we want employment for our residents. That produces income, of course, and the chance for a better standard of living. We also want quality of life. These are our objectives for improving our competitiveness. And then the next question is, how can city leaders get these outcomes? And there are many ways. We're taking up one way today, and that is by attracting investment. Now, we're focusing here on foreign direct investment in emerging market economies, a suitable mission for the World Bank, I believe. Of course, the similar arguments uh, would apply for domestic investment, and somewhat different arguments would apply for developed country investment. I also want to acknowledge at the outset that uh, we are aware that there are potential downsides for foreign investment in emerging market economies, and those we can take up in a separate session, but we won't deal with them in this paper or in our conversation today. If we want to attract investments from companies abroad, the question is what motivates business managers and decision makers to make those investments? And I think there are two main sets of arguments to explore. First of all, one major set of motivations, especially for emerging market economies, is we're looking for places where we can reduce our costs of production and build an export platform, and that's symbolized by the photograph of the port on the bottom left side of this screen. But another motivation is also important for all economies, and that is to serve the domestic market, to sell goods and services to the local population. These are our two main motivations. Now, to achieve these objectives, business managers' decisions depend upon, uh, I think, three sets of, 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 of uh, or categories of variables. And I'll mention them here briefly, and we'll take them up more carefully in the succeeding slides. First of all, we care about the conditions of supply of factors of production, about the prices of labor and materials, about the productivity of those inputs. We care about complementary inputs, not only labor. And we care also about this concept of clusters. Those are also important to potential investors. Secondly, we care about the size and functioning of markets. And thirdly, we care about the business or the investment climate. Now use these two terms, business and investment climate, interchangeably. And I include in that category things like infrastructure, institutions, government, and the competitive landscape. I want to move now quickly to lessons we learn from experience, what we know from the recent past, from the actual experience that businesses have. First of all, bigger and faster growing markets are important for all investment decisions, even those whose purpose is exporting. And this is a matter not only of how many people are there to buy products and services and how much income they have, but also businesses want a sense that the market in which they are participating in the future will be one that will be um, growing, large, stable. It's a matter of confidence. Investment is a long-run decision, and so confidence in the local economy matters. Secondly, wage rate for labor is not the best indicator of attractiveness for foreign direct investment because low wages might mean low skill or low wages might mean low productivity. What we really care about is the unit labor cost of production, which is a matter of the wage rate we pay times how much labor we use, that's our total wage bill, total payments made to labor, 
compared to the output that labor produces. So this is the combination of wage rates and productivity which together make unit labor cost of production. And of course, then there is also the cost of other inputs, not only labor. So we need to generalize this finally to the unit total cost of production. On the next slide, the second lesson from experience about inputs uh, is about clusters. Clusters are important. Now what we mean by clusters is the co-location in the same geographic region of firms in the same industry, or it could be firms from the same country of origin. And the reason why these clusters are important is threefold. One is because if you have lots of employees doing similar kinds of jobs in different companies, we create informal networks for knowledge sharing. Informal because it's off the job. It may be conferences, lunches. It may be simply being a resident of the same geographical region on evenings and weekends, meeting like-minded people. And it means keeping up to date on the latest news concerning your technology and your production. Also, if you have several large number of companies uh, with the similar kinds of production technologies, they will attract workers with a similar set of skills. And the result is an expanded labor pool from which any one company can uh, draw its own employees. And similar to that argument is the supply chain for inputs and distribution. If you need suppliers of parts and components, suppliers for services, if there are several and many companies like yours in the same region, there'll be more suppliers for these particular parts, services, and components. Similarly for distribution. And the photograph you see on the right hand half of this slide is of Silicon Valley, perhaps one of the best examples of a cluster. You can't read all these company names there, but there are companies like Hewlett Packard and Oracle and Cisco and Apple. They're all there. They're all IT companies, software and hardware companies. And one reason why Silicon Valley succeeds at a, as a competitive location is because of this cluster of similar companies. Continuing a second set of experiences um, is uh, about government. Government does make a difference. Um, it's partly a matter of government policies. Um, for example, governments influence um, infrastructure. You see on the um, slide um, a, let's see, Sorry, let me go back one slide. You see um, <clears throat> infrastructure. You see roads, rails, ports, electric power, telecom, water, represented by these photographs in the bottom half of the slide. This is physical infrastructure, and it's important. But I want to also emphasize that not all types of infrastructure are needed by all companies. For example, we believe that India as a country has infrastructure weaknesses. And yet Indian software services are the leaders of export success in the world. How can this be? Because roads, rails, and ports are not important to software. And therefore weakness in those elements of physical infrastructure are not crippling. So infrastructure is critical, but it depends which infrastructure is needed by which industry. Then the next slide shows us um, continuing uh, government influences uh, where we have policies. For example, we know that special economic zones uh, are a motivator for attracting foreign direct investment. Um, uh, but I also want to qualify this um, incentive because to the extent that almost all countries and major uh, manufacturing or service locations offer these benefits, it becomes no longer a differentiator. It becomes necessary, but it's something you have to have 
once you've got it, you are in the game, but it doesn't give you an advantage because everybody else has it too. Government also means a quality of services provided, efficient services. It means regulation that is reasonable, but not burdensome. There is no complaint by businesses about regulation except unreasonable regulation. May I give an example here? Um, we've heard just in the last few days, actually, about a decision made in India by the government uh, that amounts to the imposition of taxes retroactively. Now that would be regarded by businesses, investors, as an unreasonable regulation because investment is long-term and it's not possible to make long-term investment decisions in the face of regulations that will change and affect backwards the profitability of that investment. So that's an example of an unreasonable regulation. Um, financial incentives are often offered by governments as part of special economic zones. Tax breaks are there. Um, I say here they're not very effective, again, mostly because of two reasons. Everybody does it. Therefore, you have to do it, but it's not going to give you an advantage. And secondly, Financial incentives are typically short-term. They expire after several years, and the investments are long-term. So in the overall scheme of things, they, as a, as a matter of weight, don't, don't measure up. Um, the left-hand corner of the slide shows, just for illustration, a range of U.S. government regulatory agencies. There are, of course, hundreds, if not thousands of them, um, and that's what we want to have to be reasonable. And the last point on government is that local government matters as well as central government. It's not just from the center, it is what you do in your own city as well. Now we come to a different part of this uh, set of slides, and that is um, some evidence on what others have measured as competitive cities. So, here on this slide, you see from two different sources a listing on the left-hand side of Chinese cities ranked by David Dollar and his colleagues from the World Bank some years ago. And you see there Hangzhou, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and Chongqing as the five leading most competitive cities in China. China has been studied more than other countries, so we have this, these data available. Now, the middle panel of this table is a different study, which includes all emerging market economies, including China, but also others. And what do you see here? Singapore, Hong Kong, Seoul, Taipei, and Shanghai. Now, of course, the first four are at the very top income end of emerging market economies. Maybe they're even called developed economies by now. And Shanghai is the first Chinese city to appear, number five, not Hangzhou. And on the right-hand side, we see worldwide, every city, every country in the globe. And there the list is London, New York, Tokyo, Chicago, and Paris. Now, there are many of these surveys, many of these studies. This is just one pair of them. And the point of this slide is that none of the Chinese cities, not even Shanghai or Hangzhou, show up among the top five worldwide. So um, that's for two reasons. One is that the criteria that are used for measuring competitiveness worldwide differ from those for emerging market economies. And secondly, it is also a matter of some of these um, measurements referring to outputs rather than inputs. And of course, the rich cities in the mature countries have a chance for better output measures rather than input measures. We'll say more about that in a minute as well. The point of this slide is to show differences, disagreement among um, authors or um, uh, researchers. Um, the uh, left-hand number column, um, I want to correct a couple of errors here uh, on the middle. The left hand is okay. Um, uh, one, two, sorry, it should be, it should be one, two, Guangzhou, three, Shenzhen, four, Chongqing, 
five. It's the same list that we had in the previous slide from the same source. The Chinese cities in order from the dollar study. Then if we look at the next middle column of numbers, including all the emerging market economies, and pick out just the Chinese cities, here's what we get. Hangzhou, which is number one in China in one study, is number 10 in China in another study. Shanghai is number two in one study, but first among Chinese cities in the other study. And so it goes. Uh, Chongqing, number six in China by one study, but ranks 12th in China, not worldwide, in China in the other study. And then finally, when you have a worldwide ranking, where do Chinese cities rank within China, not among their competitors worldwide? Hangzhou does not show up at all. Shanghai is first in China. Guangzhou does not show up at all. And Shenzhen is third, Chongqing fifth. The point of this slide is that you get vastly different impressions about competitiveness depending on who does the measures using what criteria. And I just want to spend one minute longer on this. What are these criteria? For example, if we look at the left-hand number column, the dollar overall ranking column, these criteria that were used are physical infrastructure, entry and exit barriers, skills and technology endowment, labor market flexibility, international integration, private sector participation, government effectiveness, tax burdens, tax rates, and finance, lending, and credit. Those are the criteria. Now if we look at the middle column and look at those emerging market criteria, we get um, a different story. There we see um, a, a different set of criteria. For example, legal and political framework, economic stability, ease of doing business, financial flow, business center, knowledge creation, and livability. Well, some are the same, different words, some are not the same. So we have to be careful before we judge our competitiveness according to who's doing the measurement using what criteria. And there is one more slide with these kinds of numbers, only it's countries, countries, not cities. Um, the top 10 in the world, this comes from the World Bank's own doing business survey. It's done every year. This is one recent year, not the most recent year. I've chosen these numbers because they match up the timetable of the rest of the paper from which this study is done. Look who you got here. Singapore, New Zealand, Hong Kong, US, UK, Denmark, Ireland, Canada, Australia, and Norway. There is no emerging market economy represented there except perhaps Singapore and Hong Kong, small island economies or peninsulars. And if you then look only at the top 10 emerging market economies, Singapore, Hong Kong, number three is Georgia, number four is Thailand, Number five is Saudi Arabia. Now stop a minute. We didn't see any Georgian cities, not Tbilisi, the capital, no Thai cities, not Bangkok, no Saudi Arabian cities, not Riyadh, in our list we've shown on the screen so far about most competitive cities. The point is that you can have an apparently top competitive country, but not have a most competitive city. There is variation between the country and the city. And that, I guess, is good news for city leaders. That is, you can have a competitive city without having your country be in the top rank. China is not here. It's 14th. I put in a right-hand lower corner box. 14th among emerging market economies, 89th worldwide. And yet Shanghai does show up uh, in our previous um, slide among uh, the top five. So cities can be competitive without countries, but the way these things are measured. And that leads us now to the last slide, which is a summary about lessons learned, what city leaders can do to improve their city's competitiveness. So my first bullet point takeaway lesson learned is 
that a city's competitiveness does not depend only on the country in which it is located. So city leaders do have scope to make a difference. Second lesson learned or takeaway is there is no single list of features that a city needs to be competitive. And that's because different industries have different needs. Software services in Bangalore or in Silicon Valley have different needs from textile and garment production in Ho Chi Minh City or in Manila. So therefore, what the city's competitive strengths needs to be also differ. So that's why one city's competitive strengths need not emulate another's. If you believe Hangzhou in China is the best, you don't need to copy what they've done, what they've got. Look at your country, your industries, make up your own list of the criteria. It will not be the same as anyone else's list. And that's why no city meets all the criteria. If you look inside these data, um, there are hundreds of indicators that are used. And among the criteria I read to you, you didn't see in the slide, for the Chinese cities, no city is top on all of them. You may be top on one or two, you may be way down the list on some others. So it's a matter of picking which ones matter to you. And third and last in takeaways is that the, despite what I just said, the short list of what is always important generally includes good government, infrastructure, human capital, and functioning of markets and institutions.